Okay, let's uh, go ahead and start. Um, <clears throat> so he hello everyone, welcome to the August Business Applications NYC event. Um, as always, we are joined today by members of both the NYC Business Applications User Group and the NYC Power Platform User Group. I would like to thank Phil Topness for agreeing to take some time off from his busy schedule to deliver a session on the PAR platform adoption maturity model. Uh, I also want to thank the event organizing committee, Mihir Shah, Aaron Fishman, Arun Vinuth, and myself, Eric Levin, um, although we might be missing uh, a couple. Before we start, let's give a warm welcome to Phil. Phil is irrationally excited about applying technology to help people better do what they need to do. He helps the world's largest organizations maximize the results from Microsoft Power Platform as part of the Power Platform Customer Advisory Team or PowerCat at Microsoft. Uh, today, Phil will be presenting the PowerCat Adoption Maturity Model, which is a framework developed after working with Microsoft uh, largest customers around the world. And you can learn how to use this model to assess where your organization is on its digital, to digital transformation journey and take the next steps to move your organization to the next level. Uh, you can visit Phil's amazing videos on the PAR platform as part of the PARCAT live channel on YouTube. And I'll add a link to that in the chat window in a little bit. So, Phil, welcome and take it away. Thanks, Eric. So I've, I've got two observations. First, I noticed that you put extra emphasis on irrational, which I respect and I think is the right thing to do in that intro. And also, I noticed the tri-state user group is four states. Was I the only one that picked up on that? Is that, is that the way it works? I have no idea. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, will share, uh, I will share my <laughs> slides. And um, these are just things my, my mind notices. Um, Let's see. I assume uh, you guys are able to see this OK. Anybody not? Yeah, we see it. Thank you. All right. So today we're going to talk about the PowerCat adoption maturity model. You can see it at that link I've got on the screen. Um, but let me just kind of add to the intro uh, before we get into the the kind of the heavy topic of that. So uh, my name is Phil Topness. I work on a team at Microsoft called PowerCat. It's the Power Apps customer advisory team. So we're a team of about, I think, about 12 people in the Power Platform engineering team. And when someone buys a lot of Power Platform, right, that top 1% to 2% of users, uh, we work with them on, um, on uh, admin and governance. In fact, the COE starter kit, which you may be familiar with, is owned and, and maintained in our team. Uh, architectural advisory, making sure that they have uh, well-running apps and using telemetry from the back end to help them uh, improve them, as well as um, uh, telling their stories. And so like anyone you've seen talking about Power Platform standing next to the Microsoft CEO has come through this team and as well as the stories on the blogs and so on. So that's what we do. Uh, you can reach me at the ways you see on the screen. There's also two YouTube links, like Eric said. Somehow I've become the team social media, um, unlikely social media champion. So we have two series. Uh, one is here, PowerCat Live. Uh, that's where as we, uh, you know, kind of uncover things for our enterprise customers, uh, and a lot, of, a lot of it came from videos we were making from our customers. We're sharing them with you. And also um, some of us, uh, mostly me, sitting down with Microsoft PMs, uh, getting answers to the questions that I had and then sharing them with you too. And then we have the Power Platform Architecture Series, which is deeper dive, 20 to 30 minute deep dives on advanced things. These are all like 200, 300 level topics focused on large enterprise. Um, so this isn't, you know, what we all learn from Shane Young. This is like, you know, once you're trying to build something large in an enterprise, this is this, these are the things that we're learning from those. So before I start talking about the maturity model, too, I get a little bit, a little bit of my personal background. So I live in uh, Northern Virginia uh, with my wife and my three daughters, and uh, you know, I've been doing Power Platform for a while. I was an MVP before I joined this team, and you know, talk about it incessantly, right? Irrationally, as Eric accurately said. And you think, you know, okay, well, everyone's coming along with you on this journey, right? As you're telling everyone about how awesome this platform is and how transformational it is. And I was sitting at the dinner table and my daughter, who is 20 at the time, she's 21, she just got an internship. So her first real job, she's using Office 365 and she's using Teams and all that. 
And at the dinner table, she's like, Dad, have you ever heard of Microsoft Automate? I'm like, this isn't happening, right? Of course, it's not this question. I'm like, Emily, do you mean Power Automate? She's like, yeah, that's it. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I've heard of it, Emily, right? It's, don't, no matter how much you think that like everyone is coming along on the journey as you're talking about this, uh, it's not always the case. And that's why we need a maturity model. And that's why you know a maturity model for transforming an organization is so important. And so that's really what we're gonna talk about today. And so if you have never heard of the term maturity model, it's a pretty odd term, right? I mean, does it mean that your company's immature or that your makers are crying toddlers not sharing their app right and really when we talk about digital transformation with power platform we're talking about a platform that's often owned by the cio or the it team but the thing is digital transformation is not a technology project it involves technology but really these are organizational change project and as much as we talk about citizen developers organizations never really massively adopt new technology. It's not a muscle they built. So these new methods of working and new processes like for core operations, they never apply overnight to an organization, right? If you look at your company or your organization, the processes and the technology that got your company to where it is today, they've evolved over years or decades, right? Someone started playing around in .NET and now C-Sharp is your platform or someone built an app in Angular and now that is your JavaScript framework. And so what we're talking about is what are those processes that an organization makes or does, and how do we accelerate that process across the organization? So with it, when you purchase a box full of Power Apps licenses, the expectation for the organization to transform overnight is not realistic, right? There's so many aspects of this transition that aren't technical. So that's why we have a maturity model to highlight the numerous factors that your organization can focus on to help you identify those areas that your organization doesn't care about because people can only change so much at once. And then with that, provide the tools you need based upon real world experience with real customers so that you can make that change. So we're talking about organizational change. And so it's worth focusing on that at the core, right? The hardest problems that you face on this journey are never technology. And so a lot of what you'll see is based upon ProSize ADCAR model of change management, awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, reinforcement, All right? And that's because these are technology projects, masquer or change management projects masquerading as technology projects. And so you will see a lot of the elements of this model and its outcome oriented nature throughout the maturity model. And this is an important component of that piece. We're gonna provide components of this type of ena enablement and the knowledge to facilitate that change across multiple dimensions. So this is a bit of an eye chart, but let's look at the maturity model all up, and then we're gonna drill into certain aspects of it and look at a few real customers. And then I'll end by talking about, uh, kind of taking one of my customers and applying them, applying the model to them to get a real world scenario. But the maturity model itself covers five levels from initial to leading. And really, these are the path that your organization is going to take as it learns anything. And so we start at initial, right? And initial is where pretty much everyone starts, right? There are no defined processes. Individuals in the organization are finding their own way or discovering power apps. And then you move up to repeatable, right? Teams are beginning to identify what works and what doesn't work and come up with common methods. And then those methods become defined. Right? They're getting documented and standardized, and that enables central administration and really opens the door to having a center of excellence team. And then as you move forward, you get to scaled where there are standard processes. And now the, the, what was defined in the, the third state level, level three, now becomes, we hope, at least just the way it's done, right? Or it's on the transition to becoming there. And this also then opens the door to allow consistent measurement of these processes as well. So business value can be assessed and measured more consistently. And then the last phase is leading, right? At this point, digitization is part of the organization's DNA. And the value that the organization extracts from this sort of transformation is well measured and well understood. 
And beyond it, the or this organization is helping set the standard for how others use the platform. So in the community and also working with Microsoft and helping to shape the product roadmap. And so we're going to talk about these five levels and we talk about a maturity model. We often talk about these five levels, but they don't happen all at the same time. And so in the maturity model, we've looked at these different dimensions, these different domains at the bottom. And so these are the different focus areas that an organization will grow level to level, but really as they need, right? This will be targeted, not all at once. And so that's important to keep in mind, and we'll look at some real examples where organizations didn't traverse these all at the same pace. And so just to kind of drill into this, let's look at the vision and strategy one, this first one. I'm just kind of talk about like, how does this progress as we go up the levels? And so an organization at level one is largely in the process of discovery with individuals kind of learning and implementing Power Platform within their own or within a small team. But as we move up the levels, we get to a point where these teams are not isolated islands of transformation, but there's a larger organizational agreement, a dedicated owner for the platform that can drive it within the organization or at least within the IT portfolio. And then as you get to level four and level five, there's an established center of excellence to drive delivery until Power Platform gets to be that central, central element of digital transformation strategy and even viewed as a competitive advantage because this organization can move more nimbly than its competitors. So that's an example of walking from level one to five in the vision and strategy. And I thought what we do to really get into this is let's look at levels one, three, five across all the domains and look at a few specific customer examples. So for level one, let's look at this example. You may have heard Lauren Taylor's story. She presented with Satya on stage. Uh, and she's done a, a number of uh, customer stories and videos for us. She's now principal at Manitou Park Elementary. Uh, she discovered Power Platform through Office 365, right? She's kind of going up to the waffle on the top left. What's this? Started playing around with it, watched some videos, asked some questions in the community, and built some apps on top of SharePoint and Excel. So it's basically solve her problem in her class, right? Measuring reading scores and some other things for managing her class. So this was not part of an overall Tacoma Public Schools strategy or even for her school strategy about Power Platform. This is someone just kind of scratching their personal itch trying to solve a problem with this technology. And that's kind of emblematic of level one, right? It's it's really kind of ad hoc. And so moving across those domains for level one organization, you look at vision and strategy, very bottom up driven, low complexity scenarios like Lauren's example with SharePoint and Excel, not something you could reuse across even other classes, right? This is something she built for herself. This really isn't a strategic decision. And then moving to the next domain, business value, right? There's no formal business value assessment at this stage, right? No targets. Really for, you know, for someone like this, the business value is in their heart, right? You know, Lauren knew she needed, had a problem she needed to solve. She needed some automation to solve it. She doesn't need to measure it, right? But she's, she's the one investing in it. And then nurture, right? There's really no formal nurture. It's all, all ad hoc. Maybe there's some app in a day events, maybe some team-based initiatives. But really it is, it's people finding their own way. Admin and governance too, it's usually completely wide open, right? The Wild West. Environments are creatable by all, there's no DLP, uh, there's no control over who can create a data gateway. In fact, I worked with someone who was, uh, wanted to play around with RPA to solve a problem in her organization. And they were in this phase and she was like, well, I don't know how to set up a data gateway. And I was like, well, you might be able to. And sure enough, we got it all configured They've attached to an existing data gateway. Not something we should be able to do, but it is very typical of an organization in this phase that hasn't implemented any controls. And then support, right? Makers support their own apps. Uh, there's really no rules or no formal support on how makers are supported or how the apps themselves are supported. Right? And here again, automation, everything's one off environments, DLP, everything is one-off. And for, for what it's worth, those of you that are in consulting, there are a lot of organizations in this scenario, right? It is a huge opportunity if you were consulting to find organizations that are in this state having many pockets of success and they have no idea this exists, right? That is, in fact, the majority of Office or M365 organizations. And then, of course, Fusion Teams, right? There's no really little pro-dev use of Power Platform and teams are working independently. 
And so in the full maturity model of the link, you'll see that each one of these has specific opportunities for progressing each domain to the next level. So across level one, right, there's several opportunities, right? Start to, starting to build awareness is kind of the theme here. Organizing training events, hackathons, lunch and learns, right? Making people so they don't have to discover, uh, discover the platform or discover their processes, but let them know what's out there. And then finding and nurturing champions. Now, of course, if you already have the Center of Excellence Starter Kit uh, in, in, installed, those reports are there for you, right? You will be able to see who's using it and how much use they're getting and find those champions and be able to identify them. And then once you have those champions identified, organize show and tells, publish case studies, shed light on these people that are having success and not just the app, but the people that are doing it. Why did you do it? How did you cross it? How did you solve the problems or find your way? And then that'll make those people uh, kind of a, not only a, a guiding light, but also set uh, available to others that are working on the same process. So now let's skip up two levels to level three. Standard Bank is the largest bank in Africa, 12 million customers, 54,000 employees. They started early, February 2017. That's really early in Power Platform years. And they grew their adoption. Now they have 400 different apps being created from operations to HR. And they've got business-led transformation at the lowest level, but also at the highest level. And so they've got organization-wide apps, but also branch-specific apps. And so they've got a lot of the elements of level three repeatable processes. They're measuring their success on how they're digitally do, executing digital transformation. They've got a center of excellence team, and they've got some still organic growth of people at the edges building their own team-based apps because they're now aware of the platform. And so if we look across those seven domains for level three, right, you've got a dedicated product owner. You've got a single voice or team that is representing Power Platform across the organization. You still got some bottom up and top down innovation, right? So we've got some apps that are across large swaths of the organization, like division wide, and some that are team based. And you've got uh, an understanding of the of how Power Platform fits in your overall IT portfolio, right? Doesn't mean it's your only low code platform or your only app platform, but you know where it fits and you know where its strengths are. So for business value, indicator understood. Right? You've got a, a clear way of measuring them continually and report it on and reviewing them against goals. And these may be macro goals like overall usage or number of apps built, as well as measuring specific high, fo high focus apps and if they're measuring their goals on efficiency. You've also got a way of identifying which of those high business value apps that we want to focus our energy on. Right now that we've got a, a defined community of champions, where can we help focus their talents and grow and build and make sure that we're doing the, the highest value apps for the organization? And so to identify those high value apps, you've got business pain points quantified both before the app starts and also measured when it finishes. And so in level three, you've got a pretty well-defined nurture campaign, right? Makers are under, understanding where the business pain points are and how the Power Platform can help them solve it, right? Through across both apps and Power Automate and that sort of thing. There's defined training and upskilling, right? So makers are no longer finding their own way. I mean, we're still all relying on Shane Young's video, let's be honest, but still there's, there's, a, there's a path within the organization for people to build apps and do it and within the procedures that are set for the organization. There's an internal champions community, right? So that you can share best practices across and within the organization. And the CUE Starter Kit Nurture module was adopted. So that way new makers are welcome. They're introduced to these, the community, and they're also confined where the policies and procedures are. Moving on to admin and governance, right? So those things, as we move into from level one to level two, where rules start to form and procedures start to form into level three, where they're now codified. And so you've got an environment and DLP strategy and a way of requesting those. Even if it's just through Microsoft Forms, you've got a standard way of requesting DLP exceptions and environments. You're monitoring app usage, you're monitoring license application and capacity and consumption, uh, consumption billing and those sort of things. And then you've got a way to use custom environments for ALM. Even if you're doing the ALM by, uh, manually, you've got dedicated environments for your key apps. Now for support, support here can be kind of a mix, right? It can involve the help desk for key apps, but a lot of support is usually still um, still at the maker level. 
And it can be kind of a spectrum here, like at this last bullet, right? IT supported or IT blessed, but we know you're supporting it here. We know where to point people if a ticket comes in or just make her supported. And a lot of the support strategy involves also making sure that you have a way to answer makers questions when they have a question around policies or request for something that's outside of policies. And then for automation, right? Environment DLP requests are automated. Apps are likely deployed manually, but still using solutions. So you've got the foundation for easy deployment and, and a consistent deployment, but also the foundation for automation in a later phase. And then communication on these processes and compliances between the center of excellence and makers is more automated and standardized, right? Standard DLP policies and that sort of thing. So makers know what to expect. And then finally, fusion teams. At this point, fusion teams, which fusion teams are the concept of like uh, pro devs or pro coders working with low coders, um, they often work, uh, plan work as a team, but work independently, right? So we'll see things getting thrown over the wall like PCF controls or custom connectors uh, for a standard set of APIs, but not really working on a, a project cohesively. Uh, we're also hopefully seeing some use of source control and app lifecycle, right? So that we've got some source control so we can go back in time if we need to uh, resurrect an old app to replicate an issue. And uh, ideally standard libraries, custom connectors, and even custom app templates that are themed and branded towards the app, right? Making it easy for people to get started and do things in a way that the organization expects. So at this level, at level three, right, there's several opportunities. Here's a few that we pulled from the overall maturity model. One is evolving your environment strategy, right? Identifying where those standard DLP policies are so that we can get makers playing in the same environment, but knowing what to expect. And also having rules for when we break out dedicated environments for key applications. And then next, standard tiers of application support. Based upon the application complexity, how critical the app is, and also uh, emerging support for makers so that they understand uh, how to work within the policies that are now defined. And then further evolving the community. Right? So the communities of champions is going to become more and more critical. And also you'll see the emergence of a career path so that these people aren't just doing this on their lunch hour, but they're now starting to be able to find dedicated roles for being the power platform champion or expert within the organization. That usually emerges about this place. So we'll now skip up two levels again to level five. So level five, Chevron is the example we often use for this one. Uh, they are definitely pushing the boundaries in many ways, right? Thousands of apps at scale. And so they have a dedicated DevOps team, dedicated support team for both makers and for key apps, dozens of people. And then um, that's, but yeah, support team for both users and for developers. And then they also have a focused uh, champions team, right? For learning readiness, hackathon training. They do that as a part of a regular beat rate so that people coming in can get trained as fundamentals of Power Platform, participate in hackathons, right? These aren't one-off events. This is part of a standing kind of pace. And so when we look at a level five, uh, organization and vision and strategy, right? Power Platform is part of their digital transformation strategy, right? At the executive level, they see this as a way to outpace their competitors. And coming through the pandemic, we saw like how quickly that digital transformation could become an important part of pretty much any organization. And the vision of the strategy is understood by all, right? And so, like I mentioned, like this could this is sometimes something that people get trained on as part of their entering the company training. And it's also understood at the executive, not just the CIO, but across the executive staff on how this type of transformation affects both you know, the CFO, uh, at the CEO, the strategic goals of the organization. And there are organization-wide initiatives to, to deliver large-scale apps. And I'll give you an example after this of one of, my, uh, one of the companies I'm working with that uh, did an organization-wide app, right, used up to the CEO. So for business value, right, they are looking at the big picture of business value, both across the organization, but also rolling it up app to app, right? How much are we saving from using robotic process automation? Well, how much are those bots saving us? Uh, power virtual agents, right? What, how many deflected calls are we getting from our chat bot? How, what do we automate with apps and Power Automate? 
and how does that compare to the amount of labor that, that would have taken us before? Right, they're rolling this all up so they can really quantify how much they're saving. And then in nurture, we've got a large internal community, and we've like given examples like with uh, GSK, the pharmaceutical maker. Right, they have a community of makers. They started at level one. It was a few people on their lunch hour, and now it's 1,500 people. Right, they've just transitioned over like a year or two. Um, that's that st that step from a lot from just starting off and people kind of d discovering this to a large structured community that was global, and that has proven value. Right, there is a defined career path. People will make their jobs uh, focusing on power platform and nurturing others or leading projects. Right, so this is an established community of mentors. There are existing adoption campaigns and structured training so that people come in, they can come in and know how to get the foundation power platform, but also know how to build apps within the organization's branding, within their DLP, and within their admin and governance. So that takes us into admin and governance, where we could talk about some of the uh, some of the structure that's put in place, right? And so if we look at this, we now start to look beyond just power platform, but into overall enterprise architecture, right? Decisions are made in the Azure and other cloud architecture that are based upon how consumable will this be for Power Platform? How do we make this easy for makers to consume? And I'm not just talking about custom connectors and APIs, but we're talking about other configuration of identity or other extensions so that we can make sure that this data is consumable by this now this very active community of makers. And practices that this company has done, they will share with the broader community, share with Microsoft, right? So they are, they are now leading the way, like this is how we have found the best way to do it. And so automation, there's automation support activities, of course, right, uh, for change ownership of apps and, and things that are typical, right? They are not one-off things, right? They are just part of the way of doing business. And a lot of this automation for the Center of Excellence Starter Kit is fully implemented and extended. And also there are uh, res responsibilities and ownership are fully understood to build and operation, operate solutions, right? So they may have a dedicated uh, DevOps team for deployment that is separate from the developers, right? And they've started to then build specialties for everything needed to get an app from uh, concept to production and support. And that deployment is automated, right? So owned by each Fusion team or a dedicated DevOps team, uh, environment lifecycle management is automated, and if you didn't see it with the Center of Excellent Starter Kit, we just released an environment lifecycle automation uh, component for it in the last couple of weeks. So that gives you a leg up on doing this sort of environment lifecycle automation, right? So environment request, DLP exception request, uh, expiring trial license or trial environments or short term environments as well. And then finally, fusion teams, right? So teams form across skills and they form dynamically to address new projects and they reform to form new projects based upon the skills of those involved and this can be uh ui ux right user experience design uh makers business stakeholders professional developers enterprise architects they will all come together to solve a problem using all of their skill sets and all of the technology and so that means that there is a common development strategy where right? citizen and pro developers are working together and not just handing custom connectors or PCF controls over. They're working together to build things. And so that way the makers and the citizen developers are they're involved the whole time. It can really shape the project, right? We're no longer writing requirements documents. We're really fully working agile. And so the opportunity at this level, right, is to uh, get capture those ideas, right? You now have a machine that can execute on the highest value ideas and build value for the company. So now your goal is to find those ideas. And so we've got in the Center of Excellence Starter Kit, we've got the innovation backlog. And so this is a way for people to submit those ideas, describe their pain points, describe the process, and then we will do some high level estimates on the level of effort to build this and the uh, the an estimate of the ROI that you will save by automating it. So that's available for you to start to capture some of those as you move up to level five. And then of course, uh, simplifying application lifecycle management, right? There are of course, the uh, the GitHub actions and the uh, DevOps tools for automating application lifecycle management, but making it more accessible for makers is definitely something we're working in the platform. And there are some tools like the uh, the ALM for makers tools that are part of the COE starter kit that you can use to start to deploy that in your organization. And then lastly, and most importantly, right? Tell what you're doing. Tell the community. Tell Microsoft so that we can learn from you and learn what you're doing and make the power platform better suited for this level of use 
in organizations. So I thought I'd give a specific example. And so using the maturity model, uh, this is a PowerCat customer, one that I'm not going to name, but it's a name that you would recognize, I promise. And they're taking a less traditional path for Power Platform. And I thought they were a good example to show how organizations aren't going to move from level one to level two to level three in these straight lines. And so they chose Power Platform not for digital transformation, but for rebuilding a couple web apps that were currently custom built in Angular. Right? So they were saying, we have these enterprise apps. We want to use Power Platform for these and no longer do custom build in Angular. They want, they basically wanted a web app and a mobile app. They're going to use Power Platform to and Canvas apps to deliver it. Now, this is an app that's going to be used for the entire organization, over 50,000 people, and created by an existing team of pro devs. Right? So this is not the traditional digital transformation that we talk about. And so let's look at it from across these uh, different domains. So if we look at vision and strategy. They had a dedicated Power Platform owner. They know where it fits in their IT portfolio, and they had it targeted to these specific corporate-wide high-visibility scenarios. And so the product, product owner for Power Platform in this company is focused primarily on addressing those key scenarios, not digital transformation, at least not yet. For business value, there was no formal business value evaluation because they had already done that when they decided to move to Power Platform from Angular. So they knew the business value of modernizing these apps and how the platform would, would affect that business value for them as well. And then we look at Nurture, right? A little surprising for a company that's deploying an app at this scale, but there's no broad Nurture program for this organization. These are not, they're not focusing on broad adoption of Power Platform. They're focusing on building a couple apps, right? So they're at level one here. But then compare that with admin and governance, right? They actively monitor usage and performance using the COE starter kit and using application insights for their core apps. Right? They have well-defined DLP policies that are very strictly controlled, and they also strictly manage their app, their environment access and app lifecycle. Right? Their environments are locked down. And then moving over to support, right? they're a little bit of an outlier here. Right? They had a support process for their existing app because this is a core app used by every employee in the company. And so they've just adapted that support process for the 50,000 people, including the CEO that uses app, right? So this is now, there's they're basically their help desk is now supporting their power apps. And then interestingly, if we look at automation, right? We think about ALM and that sort of thing. This, this team decided not to invest in ALM for this initial deployment of, of uh, power apps. They did standardized manual deployments using solutions and this was a strategic decision, and it was also coupled with some ALM limitations we had in the platform at the time. And now they're moving towards ALM, but they're uh, you know automated deployments of this app, right? But they're very low on this one. And then finally, we look at fusion teams, right? Well, they're not technically like a fusion team, like we think of citizen developers and so on. They read business stakeholders, infrastructure planning, UX design, all working on one project plan to deliver these apps. And I wanted to highlight this because not only this is kind of an unusual case, but it shows, you know, even though we talk about level one, two, three, four, five, you know, organizations have focus areas. And so it's important to discuss this within your organization, an organization you're working with. Where do you want to focus with, focus on, right? They made conscious decisions on each one of these to not focus on nurture and to focus on securing their platform and admin and governance. And so for a team like this, what's next? Well, at this point, they've evolved to where they wanted to be for their apps. Their apps have been a huge success, right? Getting hundreds, sometimes uh, sometimes a couple thousand users every hour hitting them. And so they are starting to evaluate broader digital transformation. And they're going to do that more quickly because they've got all of these things at level four and level five, right? They've got uh, a framework for uh, for admin and governance and for support. And so now they can turn their focus to these things on the left-hand side and move more quickly because of the foundation they've built. So I wanted to provide this as a real example of how an organization can be successful, but maybe focusing on different levels across maturity model domains. And so to close, where do you get started with this? And so you could see the uh, maturity model at that link there. Read through it and assess, like, where is your organization's maturity model? And then looking at it and thinking of that last example, right? Where do we want to focus short term? Where do we have executive support to focus? And choose a few, right? Don't try to don't try to do too much. Choose a few to focus on 
and then use the resources provided at this link to then move from where you are to where you want to be level by level. Use pilot projects to test it, shape it to your needs. And then share what you learn in the community, share it with Microsoft so that we can all learn from what you're doing and we can roll it back into the platform into the Center of Excellence Starter Kit to make it better for what you're doing. Thanks for taking the time to learn about this. Thank you, Phil. This is Aaron. Really appreciate that. I learned a lot today. I've uh, worked with a lot of different clients with a lot of different uh, levels of maturity in all those different domains. <laughs> so it's good to see that it's formalized now and we can uh, pick our spots. Very cool. Thank you. Um, we can open up the questions now too. Anybody have any questions? A little bit above our pay grade. <laughs> Say it again. A little bit above our pay grade. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a it's a big topic, but uh, what I like about it is, uh, you know, if you look at the if you look at the model on the website, uh, there are resources for each level, right? So it's like, yeah, we would like to get to this level. What do we do? It's got some tools for it. But it is it is a big topic, and it is a topic that is focused on large organizational transformation, which isn't what we always talk and talk about in community meetings. Yes, well, it gives everyone like I imagine it's pretty rare to see a uh, an organization that's at level five across the board. So yeah, it seems like yeah. there's always somebody something to work on, right? Yeah. And the platform's changing under your feet, too. So once you think you've got it, you know, things change. Yes. The moving target. I'm yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Definitely. So yeah, they do keep us on our toes. That's for sure. <laughs> cool. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a very important topic in the sense when you have large scale implementations, especially yeah. on the adoption side. Uh, I have not I have experienced that if change management doesn't come up in the beginning of the project and takes care of the you know the impact on the user base, I think this is a very good uh, way of introducing to as many users as possible to the change management aspect of the project. Yeah, and I, th I think even just that awareness of the importance of change management, if someone has to share, I think share this one, um, is, uh, oh, here, let me copy the link too, is, is important. Like I, I, uh, one a different company I worked with, one that whose name you would certainly also uh, also mention, and the VP uh, was, hang on, let me this link, I can't do two things at once. Um, I asked about some of these some of these change management questions, like you know, how are you going to, uh, how are you going to get everyone to come along and and understand you know uh, what this new platform is and how to incorporate it into the enterprise architecture because they were building apps for well over a hundred thousand users, and uh, you know the VP's response was you know well we told them to use it so they will use it right that is a risk right that is a warning if you get a response like that. That is a warning that change management is going to be a problem at this organization, and you will need some of these tools. Yeah. I've Dave, seen... was that the slide you were looking for? Or maybe it was this one. I think it was the one that showed all of the, yeah, I think it was that one. Yeah. Yeah, and and at the uh, at the link too, then there's uh, some links on for each one of these with what actions you can take to move up. Okay, thanks, Phil. Mm -hmm. Great, cool. Well, thank you everyone for for diving into this relatively heavy topic. This this meaty topic. Yes, we appreciate it, and we look forward to having you back soon. I, I'd like that too. Let's build something next time. Ah, yes. You always no. like to sh you always like to do demos. Today <laughs> it was all slides. So yeah, yes. right. So like a, yeah. This is a collector's item. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now you're talking. All right. Uh, so, Aaron, you want to just close out? Uh... Yeah, we'll just uh, give everybody. We have some more information. Thank you again, Phil, and everyone who participated today. Uh, we just have some additional information before we let you go here. Uh, our Microsoft user groups are still in public preview. 
And we have started transitioning our user group to this new platform. So if you have a chance, please register here. We've also started putting our events there as well. And once the platform is live, um, we're going to be, you know, basically transitioning over to this uh, as much as possible. Right, Eric? That's the goal. Okay. So uh, obviously, you know, there still may be a couple of gaps as they're working it through public preview. But uh, ultimately, this is Microsoft uh, user groups and, you know, they intend to make it a premier platform. So that'll be the direction we're headed in. All right. We have some additional announcements. Uh, Power Platform 2021 Wave 2 Early Access is now available. Power Platform Tools is available in the marketplace for plugin development, debugging, and deployment. The latest release of Power Platform Center of Excellence is now available with new functionality. Um, Custom pages have been released and are now in preview. You can embed Canvas apps as home pages or in dialogues and panels in your model-driven apps. We have new functions in the PowerFX language and Canvas components can now directly access uh, scope, such as global variables, collections, controls, and tabular data sources. All right, so thank you, Eric, for compiling these uh, announcements. This is great. I just, uh, I'm learning here too, so this is good. Um, our next event is scheduled for uh, mid-September. The exact date, speaker, and topic will follow in the next couple of weeks. We are planning to have sessions on the data integration side of things, such as the data integration services like data export service and migrating from data export service to Azure Data Synapse, formerly known as Azure Data Lake. And robotic process automation and power automate desktop flows are uh, additional topics that we're looking at for future sessions. Feel free to communicate with us uh, if there are any particular topics that you would like to hear about. We do have uh, a lot of people in the community who are eager to speak and share their knowledge. So uh, if we know the topic, we can put out feelers and see who wants to help us. Again, we thank everyone for attending. And of course, a special thanks to Phil it's an excellent session, and thank you also to my fellow members of the organizing team. The video of this event will be posted to our YouTube channel in the next week or so, and we will notify you through both user groups. Thank you again, and have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot, Phil. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron.